Coming up on DTNS, will the chip shortage kill Apple's momentum? How Spotify's tech slip-up undermined an otherwise stellar quarter, and the newest YouTube stars don't have human bodies. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 28th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Uh, we were just troubleshooting Scott's Skype connection, which mysteriously disappeared and then came back. And now yeah. we're doing the show. Get the wider conversation, troubleshooting, and uh, a lot of talk about rats on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Snap is adding a new popular feature to its map to suggest popular places that it uh, thinks you might want to visit based on your and also your friends' past behaviors. Snap map users will also see things like bars or restaurants they've tagged in past posts or just favorited to come back to later. It's been a big 24 hours for quarterly earnings reports. It's that time of the three months. Let's start with Alphabet, which beat analyst earnings and ad revenue estimates in Q2. Revenue up 62% on the year to 61.9 billion. YouTube ad revenue increased 84% on the year with 2 billion monthly viewers. And YouTube TV saw monthly US viewers up 20% on the year to 120 million. Google Cloud reported $4.6 billion in revenue, its third straight quarterly increase since Alphabet started breaking out the business. Over in Microsoft's corner, the company beat analyst estimates on earnings and revenue in its Q4, with revenue up 21% to $46.15 billion. Intelligent cloud revenue increased 30% to $17.38 billion, with Azure revenue in that unit up 51%. Teams now has over 250 million monthly active users, and more personal computing revenue increased 9% to $14.09 billion. However, surface sales decreased 20% due to supply challenges. Canada's Shopify nailed its Q2 earnings. The up-and-coming challenger to Amazon retail saw revenues rise 57% year-over-year. Merchant services rose 52%, and subscription products rose 70%. And it makes money. That's right, a growing tech company that's already profitable. Adjusted net income more than doubled over a year ago at 284.6 million. Analysts expected earnings per share of 97 cents. They got $2.24. But Ooh. you may say, Shopify doesn't have AWS. Amazon has the smarts to turn its technology into profitable businesses of their own. Well, Walmart says, hold my hard seltzer. Walmart announced it will integrate its online and in-store fulfillment technology into Adobe Commerce Platform, as well as Magneto Open Source, for other retailers to use. They'll also integrate Walmart Marketplace as well, in case you want to sell your stuff on walmart.com. Retailers who use Adobe Commerce will be able to show store pickup options, communicate with customers about pickup orders, and handle selection and substitutions by employees. Oh, and friend of the show, Brett Rounceville, asked us to mention the Keep Oakland Alive, the local shopping startup we talked to him about that he helped get off the ground, has become called Nearby and just launched in Austin. So you can try it out in Austin now. Best wishes to Brett and company. Very cool. So you might recall that ZTE released the Axon 25G last year. It was significant because it was the first under the screen front facing camera phone. The company announced the update, the Axon 30, which now doubles the pixel density in the transparent area over the camera with a more seamless integration and also claims improved performance on the generally subpar results from the Axon 20. People said, great idea, didn't work that well. well Maybe it'll work a little bit better. We got the Axon 30 now. The phone comes out on August 3rd in China, starting at 2,198 yuan or about 338 US dollars. Now, there I am estimating about seven of you out there going, you talked about Shopify earnings and not Apple. Ugh, your bias is showing. Well, we saved all of this for Apple right now. Apple had its <laughs> usual glowing earnings report a 36% rise in revenue overall year over year. iPhone sales increased 49.8% from $26 billion to $39.5 billion. It remains the cash cow for Apple. And services, which Apple sees as its future cash cow, rose 33% 
from 13.1 billion to 17.5 billion, steady march up for services. Other products, which includes wearables like watches, AirBod, AirPods, AirPods, uh, was up 40% to 8.76 billion. China even looks good again, uh, with a 50% increase in revenue on the year. But Apple's earnings call cautioned that supply constraints would affect its iPhone lineup this quarter. So it's not all rosy going forward. The iPhone is still the engine of Apple's revenue, and Apple warned that revenue growth would slow next quarter because they won't be able to make enough iPhones, maybe. Apple and Cook in particular are excellent at managing supply chains, but some suspect Apple was only able to keep the iPhones coming in the previous quarter by eating into stockpiles meant for future quarters. Apple's extra cautious on these things. Last quarter, Apple warned that supply problems could reduce iPad and Mac revenue by three to $4 billion. And in this earnings report, Apple said the effect was limited to just iPads and it was less than $3 billion. In fact, Mac and iPad sales broke quarterly records with Mac revenue up 16% and iPad revenue up 12% year over year. Now, Cook says the constraints are not on the new stuff. It's not on the 5G chips, the modems, stuff like that. It's on the legacy nodes, the production parts that have been in production for a while. So that's what you need to pay attention to if you're really trying to follow this story closely. However, the Wall Street Journal said other component suppliers for Apple have reported orders in line with or stronger than previous years. That implies Apple thinks it'll be able to get the chips it needs to assemble all those components into a whole product. So even though they're warning investors that they might not be able to, they're telling the, they're ordering the components as if they will. I mean, this is Tim Cook. It's supposed to be his bread and butter, right? This is the if guy. Anybody, that, if anybody can solve it, right? Yeah, if yeah. anybody can do it, he can, because he's the guy that took, you know, logistics at, at Apple, took it to the next level, and basically set himself up to be eventual CEO of the company, and rightly so, probably. But uh, even they have to be cautious about this. They can't control everything. They can't. They can't bust in line either and push everybody out of the way. I mean, they kind of do that a little bit. Well, actually, they do do just that. Just right. right. <laughs> yeah, for being so dominant. But they can't entirely do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they can't just do that. So I'm not surprised to hear this, except uh, what would surprise me, well, what would surprise me is that it would either be as bad as either they or analysts say, uh, because I think they plan for this. Like you alluded to earlier, they, they have to, you know, sort of, Throw it out there that, yeah, we expect some delays. We're not exactly sure of this and that and the other. And then they beat the expectations a little bit. Um, it's a little like, you know, ship or tell them you're going to ship late, but then ship early. It's a little bit like yep, that. Yep. So I have a feeling Under that promise, this will... over deliver. Yeah, that kind of stuff. they do they that. They haven't done They're a forecast in more than a year because they keep saying pandemic choppiness. We don't know what's going to happen. That That's how cautious they are. Yeah. I mean, listen, the iPhone sales over the last quarter. Wow. I, I mean... Apple is, that is your cash cow, uh, Apple. Obviously, services has seen a rise as well, and it'll continue to shift. What, you know, I think that I may be echoing a lot of other people's sentiments where it's like, okay, so Apple's really great at the supply chain. Tim Cook, now running the company, is is this is his 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 niche right this is this is what he's good at this is why he has taken the company uh so far um while he's been you know at the helm but lots of other companies do the same thing and have really really smart people running the show and why 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 has apple you know somehow eluded this whole supply chain issue up until now and i think the answer is it won't forever you you can only do so much, you know, uh, behind the scenes trying to, you know, you know, stack the blocks to make sure that this doesn't happen to you. But supply chain is supply chain. Yeah. You know, I mean, at a certain Apple, point, unless even, Apple has some like secret underground bunker where they're making right. stuff that no one else knows about, and that's not happening. At, at a certain point, there just aren't any components, and it doesn't matter how magical Tim Cook's skills at supply chain management are if you can't get them. Right. You can't build the the, the phones. And I think that's what he's implying is these older nodes, we don't know when the supply constriction is going to happen. I'm guessing they're right. The analysts are right who are guessing they've eaten into their stockpiles. And they're like, well, unless we come up with an idea, we're not going to be able to make enough iPhones. We should warn analysts about that. Hopefully we'll figure it out or supplies will loosen up or something like that. Well, speaking of niches, let's talk about the music niche. Uh, Spotify listeners rose 22% to $365 million, or million users rather, in quarter two. And that might not you know, sound too bad, sounds not shabby at all, but it's less than everyone. 
this is including Spotify's, uh, what, you know, what they expected. So nobody, nobody thought that they hit what they were supposed to hit. Spotify noted that with fewer people on the go, uh, because of lockdowns, that might have something to do with it. Fewer people may be willing to pay for music and podcasts. And that was an expected effect. Uh, there was also this technical reason that they didn't sign up as many people. They didn't see it coming. At one point, Spotify made a change that stopped signups from being properly verified through one of its partners that handled email verifications. By the time Spotify noticed the problem and fixed it, it had failed to verify between one and two million accounts. That is not nothing. That's a lot of people. Uh, the good news is, though, paying listeners, uh, which Spotify you know makes more money off of anyway, rose 20% to 165 million, which is, you know, again, was to be expected. Uh, the amount of time people listen is on the rise as well, with Spotify saying it nearly, uh, it's nearly pre-pandemic levels is where they're at. Spotify uh, noted that its podcast listening rose 30% year over year, with total hours consumed reaching an all-time high, up 95%. And beginning, uh, and it's beginning in, in money, or it's, it's bringing in a bunch of money with podcast ad and revenue up uh, almost a meaningless 627%, which beat expectations. <laughs> we'll talk about why that number seems... Uh, slow, small to some and huge to others. But anyway, Spot, uh, Spotify's uh, revised its year-end forecast down from 402 to 422 million active listeners to a paltry 400 to 407 million active listeners per month. Which implies that 422 was maybe a little inflated, uh, and the 400 to 407 is probably more in line. Uh, but man, this is a great earnings report if Spotify hadn't had that glitch, right? Uh yeah. It's it's still not deadly. It's not like it killed Spotify's quarter. They you know they're they're making money off off the paying listeners, and that went up twenty percent. It's overall good news. But oh, you, you they must be looking at that, going why why did that happen? You know why why did we let that happen? Because uh, uh, you know that happens, and you lose a few thousand, you're upset. You lose one to two million, that, that impacts your bottom line. I mean, the good news is that, sure, if there was something that it went wrong behind the scenes, the company is going to make the same mistake in the next quarter. So it'll it'll rectify itself. I I remain so I was about to say impressed. I don't think impressed is the right word, but so interested in the idea that podcast slash audio consumption companies have taken such a hit from the pandemic. And the idea is that People aren't moving around as much. So people don't like this kind of content because people like this kind of content when they're going from point A to point B. Uh, you, you know, uh, gaming companies, uh, video content companies have not had the same issue. It's the it's the audio companies that have, have taken a hit and the same audio companies who are saying, okay, life's coming back to normal. We're, we're you know, things are okay again because it is really about someone's routine and where they can fit in something as they're doing something else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. Stuff it's, that, it's, that you can park your butt on the couch and do, uh, <laughs> weather the pandemic better than stuff that leaves your eyes free to, to you know, get bored and want to do something else if you're not driving or biking or walking the dog. or I mean, that, that just yeah. kind of makes sense, right? You, you might see the switch back. Uh, just last Wednesday, we were talking about how Netflix, uh, their earnings and their expectations were tempered a little bit by people going out again. Yeah. Maybe that and, flips. And Spotify right? is saying, like, yeah. we're starting, yeah, to, it's it's the starting to loosen up. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. we're starting to get better because of that. So you're right. Uh, it's it, it depends on how you look at it. I think it's also interesting that they're making all this money off podcasting. Spotify mm -hmm. has made a big bet on podcasting. A lot of people have been skeptical of whether it would pay off for them. It's still too early to say for sure it paid off. Uh, but like you said, 627% when you're coming from almost nothing is is somewhat meaningless, Scott. Uh, you're not wrong there, but but. Uh, they are bringing it to an all-time high. They are continuing to skyrocket. And that's what you need to see at the beginning of the hockey stick, right? You need to see yeah. it skyrocketing like that. Uh, and I I think it means that, you know, Spotify, with all of its acquisitions, it continues to make them, bringing in technology, uh, so far is working. There's still yeah, a question I, of whether it can keep the momentum up, but so far it's working. I think it should give, I think it should be encouraging to content creators of all types, us included, to see that and see that that went well, because that usually is a temperature of what's sort of happening everywhere in theory. And, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens, but you know, we all have our personal Joe Rogan's to bear. 
<laughs> I don't know what that means. Well, that I means think... Spotify is like, oh, we will bear him happily as long as that <laughs> money keeps pouring in. Uh, we're absolutely fine with that. Uh, all right. We're also absolutely fine. In fact, more than fine with Dan Campos, the host of NTX. And he has a message for you. Did you know that until 2009 in South Africa, carrier pigeons with USB drives were a faster way to deliver information than using the Internet? The best way that you can get your weekly tech news faster is by listening to Noticias de Tecnología Express. It's a bird. It's a plane. Es Noticias de Tecnología Express. All right. On August 31st, back in 20, uh, 2007, rather, uh, Hitsune Miko debuted. You remember her? She was a Vocaloid, or a software-created pop star. Miko used Yamaha's Vocaloid 2, 3, and 4 singing synthesizing technologies. She's performed live on stage thanks to rear cast projection. Wow, right? Mm, kind of old-fashioned now. With free downloadable software at Live 2D Cubism, there are others, but this is a popular one, anybody with a decent avatar illustration know-how can become a VTuber for just less than $100. That is right, a virtual YouTuber. VTuber. They can go live. They can appear in each other's streams. They can chat with the audience in real time. It's like people, but they're not people. In fact, with YouTube's Super Chat, where people pay to have their comments highlighted and then pinned to the top of live chats during streams, increasing the chance that they'll directly interact with the stream host, a VTuber can make a decent amount of money. Restofworld.org has a really good article about how the pandemic has fueled the rise of the VTuber. Definitely existed before, big in Japanese culture, but starting to catch on elsewhere. Kitsuna AI launched in 2016 and is considered the first genuine VTuber, an entirely digital YouTube celebrity. She's rumored to be voiced by Nozomi Kasuga, created by production company Active8, and Kazuna AI has done live concerts on YouTube, TikTok, Bill Bill, Oculus, performed on stage in real life with a human band at Zep Haneda Music Hall in Tokyo back in June. So it's not unlike having a favorite animated character that has a storyline and never ages. But Kazuna AI is interactive and live. We're talking to you. You want her to. In August of last year, Playboard reported seven of the top ten super chat earners. Again, that's that that's where people are earning money on YouTube, were VTubers. Kiria Coco led with $100,000 in a single week. By October, VTubers' views grew to more than $1.5 billion per month, and it's estimated that the number of VTuber performers now exceeds 10,000. The corporate world also taking notice, as they do. In April, Netflix debuted a half-sheep, half-human VT. V female VTuber named Enko Mae Carano to personally and directly be a part of the anime fan community. In June, also to ce celebrate the 30th anniversary of Sonic the Hedgehog, Sega had a Sonic appear as a VTuber. Also in June, Guar Gura became the most popular VTuber in the world, beating Kazuna AI's subscriber count by surpassing the 3 million mark. She often streams while playing games. That is what you might be familiar with, just like a popular streaming human would. So there's a big human component to all of this. And that part is really important. You just aren't supposed to know or care who that human is behind the scenes, even though you're hearing their voice or somebody's voice. Back in July, Sony Japan also opened auditions for what it calls the largest virtual talent development and management project in history, with plans to debut 50 VTuber talents. So this this makes sense in Japan. If you follow the idol culture there, uh, I think it's, I'm going to get the name wrong, AKB48, uh, something like that, has been uh, an idol group that's got dozens and dozens of members, and they keep rotating through them. Uh, and so the members aren't what's important at any given point. It's the membership, and you're a fan of that. So it's, it's a culture that leans into VTuber, where you're like, oh, I want to... I want to idolize somebody, but man, uh, isn't it cool if they can talk back to me? It's not just yeah. as one way if I can pay for super chat and get them to respond directly to my chats. And then it's virtual. 
So that person is shielded because the other side of idol culture is the dark side of stalking and people trying to figure out where they live and whether they're dating someone. Uh, whereas if it's virtual, that, yeah, there's a real human behind the voice, but that kind of melts away because you're looking at the animated version. And so there's right. there's less of a temptation to go find them because you're like, well, that that person I'm looking at, that, that uh, Kiryu Koko is not real. You know, it's interesting. Um, so I fiddled around with this a little bit because I wanted to see what I could do on Twitch. And I don't remember the utility I used. It was a web-based thing that basically let me be a selection of, I don't know, 10 sort of anime-looking characters. And and um, it all was very weird and actually kind of impressive because the camera would recognize my movements and facial expressions and would translate those on screen. And and really, this is all kind of a, an outpouring of that. And people have really glommed onto it. Um, I've had people say, Scott, the problem with that is that you could have some you know 54 year old dude who's pretending to be a young uh girl and is like attracting a giant audience of fellow young girls or whatever and it's all a little weird don't you think and uh, my answer to that was I don't, I don't really know what to make of this yet like in some ways i understand the the intrigue of it it's uh it's a way for you to truly be an avatar or be i don't know it's like cosplay or anything else you get to kind of be somebody else uh, while you're online. And that has all kinds of connotations, positive and negative. Um, but it is fascinating. Like it's a really fascinating new way uh, that people are communicating with their fan base. And it's obviously here to stay. There's enough money involved now and enough popularity involved. This isn't going to go anywhere. So well, I find kind it kind of, of fascinating. Kind of to Tom's point, And, you know, again, I agree with you, Scott, we're, we're kind of a little bit of a wait and see issue here, but you know, for someone to be like, I like idol culture. I want to kind of be obsessive about this. I want to tune into everything. And this is actually maybe less problematic than this happening with a real person. Now, you know, if somebody wants to be problematic, they're going to do it anyway. But there is something I think that feels like it's less of that mm, you're, you know, going too far, being a little too creepy, barrier to entry type of thing when you just kind of want to focus on something and, yeah. and, and put a lot of time into it. And, it, and if you want that fantasy, it might feel a little less creepy if there's not a human on the other end, even though, again, there's a human voice again, but you can pretend yeah. like, well, it's not too weird for me to talk to this animated character. Cause it's just an animated character. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, that can, you could see that as a negative, but I could see a lot of people seeing that as a positive of like, that's harmless, right? Cause it's, it's a fictional person anyway, but it, I, I get to interact. Yeah. I, I listen, I'm, I'm pretty new to this whole VTuber thing, um, as of today. Uh, so I, you know, I was, I was watching a bunch of stuff earlier, you know, in, in preparation for this conversation and Guargura, who's now the most popular uh, VTuber, at least for now, you know, based on uh, people tuning into live streams. And I mean, there is a voice that you're like, oh, wow, it sounds like a kid. Might not be a kid. Um, might just, you know, be a voice actor probably, of some Probably kind, not you know? a kid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, but, but I get why this is this is pleasant. It's fun. You know, it's like, Oh, look, I'm trying to park a car in this game that I'm playing. I don't know. The yeah, name yeah. Of the game. But you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I even found myself being like, no, this feels safe and kind of fun. And whoever's behind the scenes, keep doing what you're doing. And I see why so many people, um, find it, uh, <sighs> Entertaining. Comforting, entertaining. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. All and of cer those. Certainly characterization and performance and that sort of thing is already part of streaming and YouTube culture. There are people who put on a mustache and a funny pair of glasses and that's their YouTube personality. And if you met him in real life, you'd hardly recognize him. This is just another step in that in that direction. It I is think. a bit of a virtual costume. In, in fact, shout out to Snowshoe in the Diamond Club community uh, who was basically doing this before it was called VTubing. Uh, I've been doing it for years. So thank you, Nick, with a C for reminding me of that. Nice. You were a pioneer. Um, let's move on to Sony. They also had a report of sorts. Sony reported it surpassed 10 million PS5 units sold on July 18th, about a month earlier in its release cycle than the PlayStation 4, making it Sony's fastest selling console, straight up, uh, which surprised me. I thought the PS2 was never going to get de dethroned in that regard. But Sony Interactive CEO Jim Ryan said that improving in inventory levels for the console remains a top priority. And you're hearing a lot of news about stores getting restocks here soon. Um, 
not unrelated, uh, Microsoft's reporting similar kinds kinds of effects. They have now the fasting selling or fastest selling Xbox in the history of that company. Uh, they sold less units overall, almost seven million, but have had similar stock issues. So, Tom, what this turns out to look like is there's two problems happening, or two things happening. One is demand is very high, and it's also hard to get new stock into the pipeline because of shortages and whatever. And they're both happening at the same time. In other words, it's not just shortages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real demand. I, I you know. know that everybody listening is like, who are these 10 million people? Uh, yeah, who are, uh, how are they getting these PS5s? I cannot possibly get a PS5. That's always the way you feel when you're on the outside of a high demand item. Anytime there's high demand, usually there's a short period of time where you can't get it. And then the supply catches up. And I think you're absolutely right. The supply can't catch up. Uh, Sony didn't expect the high demand that they got, neither did Microsoft. And unlike in the past where they can call up the fab and say like, hey, we want to place 10,000 more orders, the fab is like, we have no more capacity. We can fulfill the orders we promised to you we would fulfill, but we can't increase them. And then that means that they stay in short supply on the shelves and it's harder to get them. Yeah, I'm, I, guess I'm, I guess I'm not surprised by the success of those numbers, but this is going to be an interesting uh, coming year. The thing we haven't even talked about here is how Nintendo was always out of switches during this time as well. So they did extremely well. Like the demand is ridiculously high. And then nightmare scenario is you can't build them fast enough to satisfy yeah. that demand. That's there, There's actually at. not a chip shortage so much as there is an inability to meet the demand for the number of chips that they could make given yep. capacity right now. Yep. And then we've talked at length about why that is, but yeah. Uh, it's y'all, y'all just want too many PS fives and, and Xboxes. That's the problem. Stop one. No, no, I'm just kidding. Well, Scott, you mentioned Xbox. Uh, so I thought that the story, uh, might, uh, be good for your tummy. Krispy Kreme has debuted the Nexus level donut as part of a new <laughs> Xbox cross promotion in the UK and Ireland. And if you buy Xbox branded donuts between August 2nd and 22nd, you have a chance at winning an Xbox Series S and also a month of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate as a new subscriber. So stand back, Destiny Toaster. Step aside, KFC bucket-shaped gaming PC. Xbox Mini Fridge, we hardly even knew you. Krispy Kreme is coming for you. But <laughs> before you get too excited, uh, a video about the feature shows actors as the team behind the donut with corporate titles like Product Innovator and Quality Assurance Guru, ha, 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 touting its revolutionary design and ergonomic form. So this seems like it's a real donut that can be had, but you have to be in the UK. So ah. if you are, please get one and let Zoe. us know what's inside. Joey, mm. send me a donut. Get yeah. some donuts. It would be a little stale, but I'll take it. Too. Go for it. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and these are just powdered donuts with green crosses on them, yeah. too. They're not yeah. like... Well, they might have jelly. We don't they know. Might. What flavor? They might. Someone ha yeah, someone's got to get that donut and let us know what's inside. Destiny flavored jelly. Mm. It tastes like <laughs> it tastes like ray tracing if you, if you think about it. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, this one comes in from Nick with a K. Nick said, your discussion of cinematic VS or high FPS video, and if the love of a cinematic 24 frames per second is a generational thing, got me thinking. It's also extended to games. While every gamer likes a high FPS, there's an argument over if you should use motion blur or not. Motion blur can give a bit more cinematic presentation, even at a high frame rate, but there is, shall we say, spirited debates over if you <laughs> should or should not have motion blur turned on. So it's not just video connoisseurs that fight over that cinematic look. We uh, now go to Scott Johnson's lawn where he's telling someone who loves motion smoothing to get, get off, off of it. it. Scott. Well, I'll tell you, I've recently got myself in a position where I can do up to uh, 144 frames per second on a PC and a video card that can do that and do it in HDR and all the bells and whistles. And there's a reason gamers aim for higher FPS almost over any other performance uh, metric. They just want faster frame rates. Faster frame rates in gaming means a better experience. Um, I don't think there's anybody who's arguing that games should run at 24 frames per second. Uh, and f uh, blurring does add a cinematic quality to the game, but it doesn't actually affect your frame rate. Um, I usually turn it off because I just kind of find it annoying uh, to have that blur there. And I notice it a little bit too much, so I turn it off almost immediately. And it actually helps improve performance, typically, if you turn that off. Um, some games use it to hide 
problems like artifacting yeah. or tearing and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on with with blurring that isn't just simply uh, you know a setting that you would prefer for a more cinematic look. I think as a point, however, um, and there is debate, spirited debate about whether blurring is uh, a worthy addition to a game or not. But there's also spirited spirited debate about reverse uh, X Y axis and your controls and whether when you push up it should go down or not. Like th there's there's these eternal arguments. This is one of them. But I can tell you almost universally. Gamers want better frame rates, and if you give that to them, they'll take that over anything else. So I prefer my film in the 24-frame cinematic way. My video games prefer at maximum frame rate. So I don't think the two things are tied or connected. I think they are two very different experiences, and it's possible to love one over here and seem like it's a problem over here, but it's not. It's actually the opposite over here. If that makes sense. It does. It does. <laughs> Yeah. Does it? Good. <laughs> yeah. No, I was I was expecting a more ranty Scott, and I got reasonable Scott. That all makes perfect <laughs> yeah. sense to me. Yeah. There's yeah. not. I mean, to to say that there's a there's no fight really. It's more like, yeah. do you like the blur? No. Well, I'd turn that off then if I were you. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> doctor. Does it hurt yeah. when you do that? Stop yeah. doing that. Stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yep. Nick, thanks for writing in and uh and yeah, helping us have another conversation on the show. If you have thoughts on anything that we talk about on the show, questions, comments, all of it, please do send it our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Thank you in advance. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Steve Ayadarola, Dan Kolbeck, and Jeffrey Zilks. Also, an extra special thanks to Paul Davison. Paul is one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Paul has been with us for some time. Thank you for all of the years of support, Paul. Couldn't have done it without you. Yeah, well done, Paul. Paul's been Paul's been with us for a while. I like it. Yay, Paul. Um, oh, also, yay, Scott. Yay, oh. Scott Johnson. Um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know what what have you been up to, man. Well, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> so much that it's hard to describe. There's been quite a lot going on in and around uh, the community that I podcast in. If you want to hear and catch up on a lot of that stuff, there's great places to do it. You can find it all. Uh, I think some really some of the best stuff I've done recently. I'm actually really proud of it. Uh, over on the instance and elsewhere. So if you are interested in anything I might have to say, uh, go check it out, frogpants.com slash podcast, or you can find me on Twitter and poke me there. I'm at Scott Johnson. Excellent. We are live on this here show, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live, and we'll be back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program.